Mission. You know, it's that time of the week again. It is Monday Night Mission with Dan Variety Hottie and... And the man nah. that is nearly blown the roof off of every major arena, not just around the country, but around the globe. The man that led men on a mission to tag team championship gold in the World Wrestling Federation and rocked MSG like it's never been rocked before at WrestleMania 10. I don't know how his name can only have five letters, but he is the man on a mission, Oscar. Brand new Monday Night Mission begins now. There are so many missions. Fans, we warned you this day would come. Unfortunately, we're running out of original episodes of Wrestling Inside His Potty with Marty each and every Thursday night at 10 p.m. But we're starting up that Indiegogo. You can help the cause. You can help Marty's show continue each and every week. Nobody does it like Marty. We had an incredible time with him at our 20th anniversary bash, November 13th at Memorial Hall here in Melrose. We want to have the good times keep on rolling, but we can't do it without you look for the indiegogo link in the comment section below or across our website and social media platforms we have some great perks great rewards where you can even meet marty himself there's nothing like it since july of 2020 every week we've brought you the show we need your help to keep on going we tell you without wrestling fans there is no professional wrestling and there's no better time to help the cause now let's keep marty rocking each and every thursday night Wrestling fans, VIP packages and tickets are on sale now. The Boston Wrestling MWF's Back to the 80s Live Wrestling Event and Legends Fan Fest Celebration, Saturday night, April the 16th at Memorial Hall in Melrose, Mass. Meet WWE Hall of Famer Hacksaw Jim Duggan, three-time WWE Tag Team Champions Axe and Smash Demolition, WWE Hall of Famers Tito Santana and Cowboy Bob Orton, The Wild Berserker, Dangerous Danny Davis, and more 80s WWF icons to be announced. Take part in a VIP exclusive Q&A session, a VIP exclusive 80s Legends group photo, an autograph photo fan fest open to all before the superstars of yesterday, today, and tomorrow light up the ring like Times Square on New Year's Eve. Relive your childhood. Get the best seats in the house at bostonwrestling.com now. We'll see you live April the 16th. Foley. This is Harley Race. This is Shelton Benjamin. This is Mr. Wonderful Paul Lorndorf. This is the Monster Abyss. And this is Daniel Bryan. This is JBL and you're watching the MWF. Be there live. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, it was another wild night on WWE Monday Night Raw. The road to WrestleMania is officially kicked off now that Elimination Chamber from the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is in the past. We are all excited about everything headed to Dallas, but even more so, we are now less than eight weeks away from the big one as Boston Wrestling Sports presents Back to the 80s. A live MWF wrestling event and Legends Fan Fest Saturday night, April the 16th from Memorial Hall in Melrose. John Cena Sr. promised eight 80s WWF Legends tonight. He announced that joining WWE Hall of Famer Hacksaw Jim Duggan, three-time WWE Tag Team Champion Zax and Smash Demolition, WWE Hall of Famer Tito Santana, the wild and unpredictable Berserker, Evil heel referee turned wrestler Dangerous Danny Davis will be fellow WWE Hall of Famer. The father of the Viper, Randy Orton. Cowboy Bob Orton joins the growing list of 80s legends. That makes seven. John Cena Sr. said if you guys buy those VIP packages and tickets in advance, he might even give you more than eight. I am mentally, physically exhausted. We've had so much going on here in the world of Boston wrestling. Not one, but two live episodes with the Berserker this weekend. Content galore, live episodes. I, I, All I can say is this. I am very happy. It's Monday night at 11 because that means one thing, fans. It means you can kick back, relax, because the WWF Tag Team Championship Manager, the guiding light of men on a mission, the man that nearly blew the roof off of every major arena in the United States and around the globe. I could only be talking about one man, the man that is still echoing through Madison Square Garden after WrestleMania 10. I could only be talking about the vice president of Boston Wrestling Sports. I could only talk and be talking about the O, the S, the C, the A, the R, the man that loves his golden corral with a little leader on the side, 
Oscar. <laughs> Oscar, it is a pleasure to have you with me, brother, because I need you because I need you to carry me tonight. I'm done. <laughs> How are you? I love my Gordon Corral with my leader on the side. Is that is that is that, how, is that how it goes? That's how it goes now. You're like a little Golden Corral with a little leader on the side. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm laughing because Mimi is over here laughing at that. I, <laughs> oh, Mimi funny. knows you she like a little leader. She, she, when she was there, she said, you're supposed to be sleep anyway. Who, me so, or Mimi? No, she, she's supposed to be. She's laughing because she thinks that that's the truth. Well, I can only go. Oh, look, number seven just walked by, Oscar. (laughs) I really am fried right now. Poor number seven. We've mentioned this elderly man. Gosh, he's got to be in his 80s, Oscar, and he walks on a walker, but he was so, he walks with the walker now because he was so bent over. He looked like, uh, is the interns here at the studio dubbed him number seven? Now, when he walks in the opposite direction, I don't know what what they'd call him. But when he is headed uh, northbound, he looks like the number seven. And he, he I don't know why, but he usually he walks by. He, he's going to be in tremendous physical condition. As noted, he walks by almost every episode when you and I are talking. And tonight we're taping much later at night than we usually do. But nonetheless, even seven is interested in uh, the Monday night mission. Even seven. Um, yeah, it's a couple of, I'm going to dive right in because it's a couple of really big developments. This is a really big week. Like you want for, to dive for, into Lita. For, for, for wrestling. Yeah. Yeah, we get to Lita in a minute. But, um, okay, now, it's, it's, a, it's a week that baffles me because I, I, I'm wondering how does things happen. And what I'm talking about is the fact that let's talk Cody Rhodes for a few minutes. All right. Now, did not Cody Rhodes build AEW along with along with the Jackson brothers and and start that whole thing. I mean, Tony Khan, of course, is the money behind it. Sure. But the talent that built AE, the, the house that AEW built was from Cody Rhodes, and I'm guessing his wife, Brandy, Ugh. and then that whole thing. So how do you get rid of a guy like that or even let him leave well you know it's really interesting certainly he is will always be part of the foundation that built aew obviously it was tony khan's financial investment but you know in order for him to make things happen and really get the company on the map to get that uh, television deal with tnt he had cody rhodes he had the young bucks he had uh, kenny omega And he had Chris Jericho, along with Jim Ross as the uh, soundtrack to everything going on as they continued to build around that core foundation. It's, to me, kind of surprising that he's gone. Um, uh, From what uh, the rumor mill says, he he was frustrated. He lost a lot of power in the the booking department. Um, And apparently uh, it, it came down to AEW lawyers interacting with Rhodes family lawyers, and they couldn't come to a a financially uh, mutual agreement. Brandy, I I still have yet to figure out, in all the years I've seen this woman, what she can contribute positively to a professional wrestling uh, production. I didn't think she was a very good ring announcer in WWE. In AEW, they tried gimmick after gimmick to try and get her on TV, which were all a failure. Her wrestling isn't very good. Her promos aren't very good. She's just, from a television character point of view, very unlikable. As a human being, she could be a lovely human being, for all I know. I think she's a very beautiful woman. But as far as what she contributes positively to a wrestling product, I don't think there's anything there. If I'm Tony Khan, where all I have seen is failure from her uh, on television, I wouldn't be so eager to sign her to... Uh, any type of a big money deal. As far as Cody Rhodes goes, I wouldn't want to lose him if I was AEW. I mean, I don't know how much money Cody was looking for. I don't know if he was looking for Jericho and CM Punk money, who I think are the two highest paid there, but uh, loss for AEW, and I tell you, certainly at a time where WWE's main event um, grouping is pretty weak and getting pretty old, 
you know, a 36-year-old Cody Rhodes is a fresh coat of paint if he decides to make the jump to WWE, which I think would be the obvious conclusion that most would come to. Yeah, but see, okay, that that goes to that goes to question number two, and I don't mean to make you talk, but I mean you a stockholder, you got more answers than the rest of us. All right, say he goes over to WWE. You know, what's he going to do when he gets there? I mean, you can't, I mean, I don't see how, you, now you could make, you could, you, you, you can job out uh, Damian Priest to him. He can get that belt. You can job out Shinsuke Nakamura. He can get that belt. But there's no way he gets the uh, WWE, the title, off a uh, Brock Lesnar or Bobby Lashley, you know, and keep it for any significant time, amount of time. Well, I, I, that, I, that, that would be so corny. I, I can't even put that in words. I think you're going to see him in a top main event position. Is, are they going to give him the world title? I don't know. I tell you this, Oscar, in 2016, I thought he was pissed on so bad with that horrendous Stardust character that they gave him that didn't fit him. You know, I, I hate to say it, but the perfect opportunity came to revert him back to Cody Rhodes when his dad passed away. Imagine the passionate promo that he could have cut when Dusty Rhodes died to, you know, go from this foolish stardust nonsense back to Cody Rhodes, but WWE didn't want to go in that direction, and he ultimately asked for his release. I applaud him for that. I think that takes character and integrity to walk away from big money like that when he really had no other big money opportunities. There was no AEW in 2016 when he left WWE. Uh, now that he comes back, he has um, been focused more on a major league product. I think he comes back much stronger than he did when he left. Um, does he ever become world champion? Uh, I think the potential is there, considering some of the other people that have unfortunately held it. Do I see him as a a top 10 player? Absolutely. Do I see him as a top 5 player? Uh, kind of borderline. But you know what? I think the potential is there. It really all depends on the creative. As far you know, as WrestleMania uh, goes, I, I think I he would certainly see. give it a boost. I, I, I mean, the reason why I'm asking is because I'm baffled because I cannot see his contract some kind of way not including that, that he's going to be a top-tier player. But that's, my, but that's my question. How do you incorporate that and make it realistic and believable? He's, his little ass certainly ain't going to beat Brock Lesnar. That's just not happening. Um... No, but I, I think, like I said, could he be in the mix? Is he a top 10 guy? I think absolutely at this point. For the money they're going to be paying him, uh, if he does sign with them, it's going to be several million dollars a year. If someone like Kevin Owens, who I see contributing absolutely little to the grand scheme of things when it comes to the main event picture, two to three million dollars a year, Cody is going to want big money. And he's going to come in for big money, and WWE is going to spend big money because they have it, and they know they need top people right now. They have none. Plus, you know, AEW has set the precedent. Since they've come into business, all you have seen are talent, top card, mid card, under card, leave WWE, whether they were released or their contracts expired, like uh, Daniel Bryan and Adam Cole and CM Punk and Kyle O'Reilly. All you have seen is WWE talent go to AEW. This is really, it's almost like during the Monday Night Wars when the big show, the giant, jumped from WCW to WWF. Cody Rhodes, if he decides to go, is the first jump from AEW to WWE, at least someone of importance. And I think that's big for WWE. They well, need to show you. people that they can still recruit you know, not just new talent that they can throw in NXT, but guys that they can take and put in the main event mix. I think that's very important to the company. Well, speaking of Kevin Owens, I'm, I'm hearing rumblings that there's a possible match with him at WrestleMania with Stone Cold Steve Austin. Now, is this important, significant, or a waste of time? 
You know, Oscar, this is really interesting. I, I don't know if it was on this show or with John Cena Sr., but I was told by a very high-ranking WWE official maybe a month ago that they were working on something big for Steve Austin for WrestleMania. And my thought process was, okay, what are they going to do? Is he going to be, I guess, referee? Is he going to be the host of the show? Is he going to be involved in some kind of a skit or vignette that would probably be, huh? I, in my wildest imagination, did not expect at the age of 57, after having his final match 19 years, I'm sorry, yeah, 19 years ago, in 2003, at WrestleMania 19, that we'd be talking about Stone Cold Steve Austin actually having a comeback match. And if we were going to be having the conversation about Steve Austin having this comeback match after 19 years that it would be against a guy like Kevin Owens. Yeah. Well, I, I just think it's, uh, yeah. uh, oh. I, I mean, I, I guess, you know what? The best terminology is a letdown, but I think it leads to a light at the end of the tunnel. What are your thoughts on Owens as Austin's opponent? Well, I, 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 I just don't, I mean, <laughs> I just don't like it. I yeah. mean, I just feel like it's a waste of what they could do. If you are going to put Steve Austin in the ring with somebody, let it be somebody like a Randy Orton or, you know, so, so, somebody of some real significance. And, you know, and I, and I, I'm not, I'm not shooting on, uh, shooting down, I should say, Kevin Owens in ring talent. I think he's got plenty of it, but in ring talent does not equal star power. Right. At the end and of the day, he's pretty much a mid-card guy at this point. Right, exactly. And, and that being the case, if you are going to put a megastar like Steve Austin in the ring for a comeback situation, then let it be a comeback situation that if it had to stand by itself, Let's say it was Steve Austin versus The Undertaker. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to him in a minute because big news with The Undertaker, as you well know. And then, yeah, it would be Steve Austin and The Undertaker. That match, if you didn't have no other match at all, that match by itself would make a significant WrestleMania impact. And that's what Stone Cold deserves coming back. I mean, I, I would even, I, I mean, even the Stone Cold versus Roman Reigns, I would come and, you know, I, I would come and sit down for that. But Kevin Owens, I mean, I, I could care less if Kevin Owens was in WrestleMania for anything. Exactly. If he wasn't even on the show, I wouldn't give a right, shit. Right, if he wasn't even on the show, right, yeah. exactly. I mean, and we're not trying to knock the guy, but I mean, at the you end know, of the day, I, I, like his, said, his presentation, go he's ahead. He's got talent. He, no, no, he's, he has got talent, but at the same time, okay, he got talent, but uh, he will, you know, he, <laughs> Ben may have done that. You know what I'm trying Shinsuke to say. Shinsuke Nakamura's exactly. got a lot of talent. Are you going to care if he's on the show or not? Sheamus right. has a lot of talent. Are you going to care right. if he's on the show or not? No, not really. Is it going to make the right. difference if you're going to watch it or not? Right. Make the list. That's right. But here is where I see the yellow brick road, Oscar. I look at it like this. Steve Austin is a very smart, smart man. I happened to be around him during my time when I worked with Ed Cohen um, in WWF in 2000 and 2001. He's a perfectionist. He's not going to be the guy that comes back and wrestles in a T-shirt and jeans. He's going to get himself into grade A quality condition for him. You know, as good a condition as a 57-year-old man can get himself into, I think. Um, you know, and, and I hate to say it, but, you know, with past usage, he can pass certain tests. If he's used as a guest, you know, there's certain enhancements he might be able to use that... Regular talents cannot. I'll leave it at that. But I think this, Oscar, if Kevin, and again, Austin is a very smart man. Uh, if Austin is coming back and you have Owens right now is who he's working with, I have to look at it like this. This isn't going to be his only match. I don't know if you're looking at a Goldberg situation where you might see him once, twice, three times a year on some big stadium shows, but... 
I don't think Steve Austin is coming back for one match, and it's only going to be against Kevin Owens. There's too many other top guys he could be working with. Randy Orton is someone that I mentioned when John Cena Sr. and I discussed it on um, Wrestling Inside His Fabulous Fridays on Friday night. There's a lot, a lot of big money opponents for him that he could be working with, and Kevin Owens isn't one of them. What do you okay. think? No, I, I, I mean, I don't know. I, my, his neck concern me as far as trying to, you know, make a mini career out of it. Mm-hmm. You know, he got out of wrestling for a reason, and I, I'm concerned about his health and well-being as far as trying to, you know, keep going. One match, yeah. Sure, I, I, or I, that's that, that's all fine, well and good, but well, you, know, you got to look at it like this. He had edges in year two, and he had pretty much the same issue that Austin did, and edges worked out pretty good. Yeah, okay. he had an injury, but it, it had nothing to do with the neck. Well, well, well. We'll just have to see how it goes. And again, I don't want to talk about someone's personal health, but and I don't know this about Steve Austin one way or the other, but I do know that there have been some of the uh, talents that were supposedly done that weren't going to be able to come back and so on and so forth that uh, in Mexico were able to get certain uh, stem cells, I believe, that you can't get in the United States to try and help the cause. I don't know if Steve Austin had that done, um, but if it was able to help his neck... Uh, get back into top tier shape. I think that's great. I know Steve Austin has said on his podcast a few times that he feels like he could go for a couple of years, and he said that for quite a while now. I just he made so much money he didn't need to. But now I do know that when uh, past WrestleManias, I know at thirty they wanted him to work Triple H. I don't know what year it was, but they wanted to do something with him and Punk. But he wanted Rock money, and I think as the biggest superstar in the history of professional wrestling. I don't care what anyone says about Rock. I don't care what anyone says about Hulk Hogan. Yes, those two men may be bigger mainstream stars with what they've done in Hollywood and other projects, but when it comes to professional wrestling fans, the man that sold the most tickets, the most pay-per-views, the most merchandise, and was more over than anyone was Stone Cold Steve Austin. For him to come back, he deserves rock money and then some. I hope he's getting it. I hope he's breaking the bank. I know how much money he made in his biggest year, and it blows away the biggest year that anyone in the history of this industry has ever had, ever had. People talk about Cena and Rock hitting eight figures. They sure did, but they still didn't make Austin money. Um, and it's very exciting for fans for Austin to come back. Uh, you look at some of the dream match potentials. You look at uh, uh, Austin Cena. Imagine what that would do. Austin Lesnar, Austin Reigns, Austin Orton, Austin Lashley. I mean, you've got a good five guys that you could do big, 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 big business with, with Stone Cold Steve Austin. You just can't overdo it. You can't water it down. You can't put him in that Billy Goldberg position where the fans just kind of go, Ugh. you know what I mean? No, I, 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 I got you. All right. Billy Goldberg. Uh, no, I, no, I, 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 I agree totally. You know, what would be uh, interesting. Let's... Imagine, and I hate to say it, Oscar, would they ever go the route of, <laughs> of a dream match that would turn into a nightmare 25 years in the making Austin and Goldberg. Um, I hope not. Nah, Goldberg almost killed the Undertaker in Saudi Arabia and almost broke his neck trying to spear him when he had a when he got concussed earlier in the match. Yeah, no, I got you. All right, now. Who would you? Well, talking. we're going to be going to the commercial break soon, so we won't bring up a new topic as of yet. But is there anyone that you personally would like to see Austin work with, and you think would do big business with, other than the guys that I mentioned? No, I mean, I, 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 I'm with you with Cena Senior. I thought him, Randy Orton, would make a, 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 a combustible match. I mean, I thought, I, I think that, that that would be, you know, beyond perfect. 
um, him going up against Reigns uh, for the title. Oh, I uh, think they, 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 that that would have been a a, a a great idea. So I'd, I'd go I mean, and see that. That that that's a, to me that that's that's wrestling. That's right. again, we don't know the condition Steve Austin's in. We haven't seen him wrestle as of yet. But let's say he is in as good a shape as he claims he is, and he's ready to go. If he's ready to go, I'm anxious to see who, you know, I, you could get five or six huge matches out of Steve Austin, and I'm excited to see the possibilities. Okay, it's it's can, nice. See, isn't it nice to be optimistic about something in wrestling for a know, change? Is, but see, here go, here go my point. Right? All right. Okay, now, Reigns, the payoff is a title. Should it, you know... Okay, but oh, so you go in with Owens and you beat him. What, what, what for? Just, just, I mean, you 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 beat him just to beat you going in and wrestling a guy just to wrestle a guy. You understand what I'm saying? I hear you, but I look at it like this. You want to know what makes me think, and maybe we should leave the fans to think as we go to the commercial break. In the month of July, they have not one, but two football stadium shows here in the United States. Money in the Bank is going to be in Las Vegas at the home of the Las Vegas Raiders. And then for the very first time, SummerSlam is going to be in July, and it's going to be in Nashville where the Nashville NFL football team plays. WWE is going to need something very special to get that many fans to travel in one month to two major stadium shows. Why, why, why? Why, why, why are we going to? Well, why, why, I mean, what's next? We gonna have start having a Monday Night Raw at the stadium? I mean, well, I mean, do you agree with me, Oscar? They're gonna need something special for two stadium shows oh, in one it's month. Going be, it's going to be beyond special. I mean, I, I think we, I, in my opinion, I mean, I would imagine Vince always knows what he's doing, but I think he's, I think they reach it at this point. I think Money in the Bank, July 4th in Las Vegas should do pretty good because Las Vegas is 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 banging July 4th weekend. I think you know that from your time out there. But I think Nashville in July is going to need a little bit of help. I think if you have Steve Austin on the show at SummerSlam in Nashville, I think that really, really, really helps the cause. If you throw in Rousey, Austin, Lesnar, uh, who knows, maybe Cena might be available. Um you know, then you're talking about a card people are going to travel to. All right. All right, let's go to commercial. Uh, uh, yeah, we, you we, are we, the we boss. Done. All right, wrestling we, fans. We you heard it stuff. from the man on a mission himself right now. Head on over to bostonwrestling.com. Get those VIP packages and tickets. When we go back to the 80s, Saturday night, April the 16th, at Memorial Hall in Melrose, Massachusetts, we'll be back on the flip side with more Monday Night Mission with Oscar. Stand by. Wrestling fans, VIP packages and tickets are on sale now to Boston Wrestling MWF's Back to the 80s live wrestling event and Legends Fan Fest, Saturday night, April the 16th at Memorial Hall in Melrose, Mass. Get the best seats in the house now at bostonwrestling.com. The World Wrestling Federation was live at the Providence Civic Center in Providence, Rhode Island, Sunday, February the 21st, 1988. The opening contest, Dino Bravo beat Jacques Rougeau. George the Animal Steel with the win over Sika via disqualification. The Iron Sheik defeated Raymond Rougeau. The Ultimate Warrior victorious over King Harley Race. Million Dollar Man Ted DiBiase beat Bam Bam Bigelow via countout. WWF Women's Tag Team Champions the Jumping Bomb Angels retained the titles over the Glamour Girls. Hacksaw Jim Duggan with the win over Outlaw Ron Bass. Demolition defeated Ken Patera in the Junkyard Dog, and Brutus the Barber Beefcake victorious over Greg the Hammer Valentine. If you were in Providence Live, share your memories in the comments section below. Use the links in the description box to keep wrestling legends working in our eBay store and on our acclaimed Patreon streaming service so we can bring you more interactive superstar shoot interviews to relive the good old days of professional wrestling. Check it out. Wrestling fans, we warned you this day would come. Unfortunately, we're running out of original episodes of Wrestling Inside His Potty with Marty each and every Thursday night at 10 p.m., but... We're starting up that Indiegogo. You can help the cause. You can help Marty's show continue each and every week. 
Nobody does it like Marty. We had an incredible time with him at our 20th anniversary bash, November 13th at Memorial Hall here in Melrose. We want to have the good times keep on rolling, but we can't do it without you. Look for the Indiegogo link in the comment section below or across our website and social media platforms. We have some great perks, great rewards where you can even meet Marty himself. There's nothing like it. Since July of 2020, every week we've brought you the show. We need your help to keep on going. We tell you without wrestling fans, there is no professional wrestling and there's no better time to help the cause now. Let's keep Marty rocking each and every Thursday night. Wrestling fans, VIP packages and tickets are on sale now. The Boston Wrestling MWF's Back to the 80s live wrestling event and Legends Fan Fest celebration. Saturday night, April the 16th at Memorial Hall in Melrose, Mass. Meet WWE Hall of Famer Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Three-time WWE Tag Team Champions Axe and Smash Demolition. WWE Hall of Famers Tito Santana and Cowboy Bob Orton. The Wild Berserker, Dangerous Danny Davis, and more 80s WWF icons to be announced. Take part in a VIP exclusive Q&A session, a VIP exclusive 80s Legends group photo, an autograph photo fan fest open to all before the superstars of yesterday, today, and tomorrow light up the ring like Times Square on New Year's Eve. Relive your childhood. Get the best seats in the house at bostonwrestling.com now. We'll see you live April the 16th. Wrestling fans around the corner, around the world, I'm Dan Marotti. And I'm Mr. USA WWE Hall of Famer Tony Atlas. The road to WrestleMania has begun. Wrestling fans are looking to add to their man caves. You got to see what we have in the eBay store. Check it out. At Night of Champions 2020, Tribal Chief Roman Reigns successfully defended the WWE Universal Championship against his cousin, Jey Uso, in a must-see battle. Here is your chance to own a piece of Roman Reigns moments before battle on this beautiful limited edition autographed 11 by 14 poster direct from friends at WWE. It's number 19 of only 50 made. Includes WWE authentication hologram on the poster itself. Suitable for framing and matting. You'll also also receive a bonus Legends autographed 8x10 photo in an on-air shout-out on Wrestling Insiders as our thanks for helping keep wrestling legends working. Get this ultra-rare Roman Reigns autograph poster now. All right, wrestling fans, welcome back to the Monday Night Mission here on Wrestling Insiders. Dan Marotti along with your host with the most, Mr. Golden Corral himself, Oscar. Oscar, did you see that wild video of the brawl that took place at a Golden Corral not too long ago? No, there was a brawl in the brawl in the corral. Yeah. Oh, you didn't. You know what? I'm going to try and find the footage and include it yeah. on this show. I don't know what led to it, but it was WWE wishes they could have had a brawl like they was at the oh, Golden Corral. To, they were fighting over the pork chop. Well, what the I, hell? I don't know if they ran out of fried chicken or what, but these people oh. were pissed. They were throwing tables and chairs, and it was a Golden Corral rumble. Oh my God! Please don't tell me that you make me too scared to go to a golden corral. Oh, I've got to find the video and insert it while we're talking. The fans will get a kick out of it, and you'll get a kick out of it when you see it. But these people were—I don't know why—but they were pissed off, and they were fighting, and they were going at it hot and heavy. Like I said, Vince wishes he could have had a rumble as hot as what happened at the Golden Corral. All right, now, here, here, go, here go a question. Now, what do we got this, now this, as we this, continue? This, this, this is going to make you think. You're going to make me we think. Got, That's are, tough. It's going to make you think. Now, rewind the clock back some years, and I want to ask you this. All right. Did anybody from, from Tough Enough have any staying power up until this point, or any point for that matter, of significance? John Morrison. Um... I think that's about it. <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> that's pretty much that's about it, yeah. I asked that question because I'm, I got the Peacock Network now, and I'm glad I got it because, you know, I was able to watch um, the goings on from Saudi Arabia, and I, I enjoyed it. I got the Peacock Network, but, you know, we started watching Tough Enough from the beginning, you know, binge watching each season. Season one? Yeah, and okay. I, 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 I'm, I'm looking at it, and I'm shaking my head because I'm like, where the hell did all these people go? They won the tough enough con, they won the contract, they got tough enough, 
Um, in, in later in later seasons of Tough Enough, you know Patrick Clark. We know what happened with with him. He never he wanted to leave times. high school. Yeah, he sabotaged his own situation. But no, nothing. Okay, John Morris drip drip, but then he ain't even. But nobody ever got. I mean, after all that, and the tough enough training and, and, and everything they went through was rigorous and everything like that. And I don't know, not none of these people who were in it. And I certainly don't know none of these people that won. I can't remember seeing not one of them even on TV. I'm like, where the hell, what the hell happened? Well, the two winners from season one, Maven, I remember Maven. Maven was was good, but even but you don't see <laughs> what the hell Maven is. No, yeah, I mean, once they released him in two thousand and five ish, that was pretty much it. I yeah, I, verbally, I thought he was great. He was in great physical condition. He was the problem was with WWE. They wanted to put them on TV right away because they were hot from the TV show that was hot. The problem was they still needed a lot more training to become full time pros. You know what I mean? They needed time at OVW or Les Thatcher's Hotland Wrestling. They didn't need to be on WWE television after I, two months of training or however long. They did it for that wasn't enough. I remember you, Undertaker, really gave Maven a beating at the Royal Rumble in 2002 to try and, uh, you know, break him into the business the hard way and teach him a lesson respectfully, which Undertaker would would, would be known to do. But I, I thought Maven just had, had oozed potential if he ever had a chance to train. Nydia had kind of a niche run when she managed Jamie Noble as kind of a, a hick that developed a southern accent. I tell you who I think really on that series one could have morphed into a really big star would have been Nowinski if he didn't have those concussion problems. He had great size. He was a good speaker. Um, yeah, he had a good look. What do you think? Now, what season was he? Because He was okay. season one, but he lost. All right, now. See, okay. Now it's starting to come full circle for me now. Now, Chris Nowinski... Didn't become a WWE superstar, but look where the hell he's at now. Well, he did become a WWE. He didn't win tough enough, but he did go on to work in yeah, WWF, no, 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 and he then he did, had the concussion no, match where he I'm, got concussed by the Dudleys. He got concussed, but he he turned that concussion situation into a, 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 a I don't know how much money that place is worth, but he has a concussion. Institute Foundation. Yeah. Now, Doctor David Reese is heavily involved. Doctor in David it. Reese and Doctor Cantu and a host of neurologists and superstars from other sports. And he has that dinner. Ah, oh, man. Okay. He so turned now, a negative into now, a positive. He turned a negative into a gigantic positive. Um. Yeah. I no, hope they go he, back to having the dinners this year. I've missed them. Um. It was a nice chance for us to get together yeah, in the fall. I, I would think that, that I, you know, I honestly think that this year coming up, unless we really relapse back into Ugh. a COVID situation, let's really hope bad. not. <laughs> I yeah, let's hope not. But I, I think that 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 they that they that they should. I mean, because you're right. I mean, it was a great way for us to get together. Where it was a great way to bring athletes together and doctors together. And raise money and awareness, and I mean, I, I think it's a great thing they have. They do fantastic work, and Chris Nowinski is working closely with Dr. David Reese. Matter of fact, it was Nowinski that was instrumental in Reese getting the AEW contract. That's, is it, how, that's how big he is now. Isn't that something? Where Nowinski and the uh, the concussion legacy has been so attached at the hip with WWE. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You, Nowinski is like pals with Triple H. He's pals with Triple H. Can you imagine that? Well, he didn't even win. Nowinski's smart. I mean, he's going after every sports league, uh, every sports team, and I guess when it comes to wrestling, every sports uh, organization. Maybe you know the UFC might be on his hit list. Who knows? I think it's a great thing. Um, the more we know about the brain, I think the more it will help. 
uh, athletes that become concussed as years go on. You know, unfortunately, there's so many that we've lost. There's so many great guys uh, that have memory issues and life issues right now as a result of the beating that their, you know, heads and brains took before we knew about, you know, the, the real uh, danger no, of concussions. No, no. And I, I, the work he does is outstanding. Was, I can't praise on. it enough. I'm telling Mimi this because you're oh. going to find it real interesting. It was Chris Nowinski that lost in Tough Enough. Season one. Season one, yep. That's Chris Nowinski, and you know who Nowinski is. The concussion leg. Ain't that something? Now, I'm telling her this because we've been binge-watching Tough Enough, and we're trying to figure out where are they now, situations where most of them ain't, ain't nowhere. But for Nowinski, he morphed that into what he's doing now, huh? The Harvard guy, yeah. He didn't, that's right. He didn't win, but look at what he turned it into. Yeah, they brought him in. Yeah, they brought him in. Yeah. Yeah, that was Right. <laughs> and, and, yeah, and look at him now. He, yeah. <laughs> Chris Whiskey like best buds with Triple H now. Ain't that something? Um, okay, now we was talking about the. You talked about the Undertaker. And one more thing though, but b- before we segue into that, do you know who yeah. else was on Tough Enough season one? Who else was on Tough Enough? Josh one? Matthews, who had a long run as the uh, commentator on SmackDown. And is now, or was the commentator in Impact Wrestling? He's involved with them oh, heavily yeah, now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Josh Matthews. He yeah, didn't have much of a wrestling career, yeah, but he turned right. into a commentator. Yep, Josh Matthews turned into a commentator. He was in season one. Yeah, so he season one was pretty loaded. Yeah, the one that was close to Maven with the with the hair. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, but no, we I bring it up because. So we're watching Tough Enough, and Tough Enough is just really, really, really interesting. But I'm just sorry that that a lot of those people, you know, you never, did, never, never heard from again. Because, but you're right. The reason why, and I'm talking to you, Dreamy. The reason why that is because they took those people, gave them WWE contracts, but they didn't send them to no further developmental. So they really could just go for two months of. of training and then go and make it yeah so, it's yeah. impossible unless you're talking about you know a dream athlete like a lesnar or something like that that comes along once in a lifetime for the average person that gets into the industry you're smart enough Oscar. you know that you need years and years of seasoning and training before you're ready for prime time yeah. national television no oh, no i mean no n- nothing like that happens Nothing like that happens overnight. I yeah. mean, I know, you know the winner. The one I think it was 2004. Daniel Pewter. I mean, he was a great athlete. That I think he went back into MMA. Um, you know, he got his first year. He got the 250 grand of the quote unquote one million dollar prize, and they decided not to renew him. So I, the whole con. It was. I think it's on paper. It was a great concept, but again, it's just WWE. Pacing and patience. They have no pacing. They have no patience for anything. All they want to do is rush, 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 rush. I remember on, I think it was season two, the Jackie Gata one, uh, who went on to marry Charlie Haas, who was a tag team partner with Shelton Benjamin. And she had some of the worst matches I think I've ever seen because, and you know, I'm not a great, a huge women's wrestling fan to begin with, but I actually <laughs> felt bad for her because she was humiliated being put in those positions working with Trish Stratus, watching move after move after move, having Trish get pissed, having Trish start stiffing her. And I believe that was would have been the summer of 02 or 03. And it was just it was just wrong, you know? It was just wrong. I know well, Kenny I, I King of Ring of Honor was on that season too, and he didn't win. He was a great athlete. He's a, a Chippendale out in Las Vegas, and he's worked for... Ring of Honor and Impact Wrestling over the years. So there's been some interesting folks. I, I don't, I'd almost like to go back in time and tr- try and revisit. You know who's someone that tried out for Tough Enough and never made it? Was the late Chad Gaspard yeah, no, of I Crime remember, Time. I, 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 I saw his um, 
and I thought that was him. I saw his audition. Yeah. Um, 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 uh, I think it was season two, and you're right, he didn't make it. But look at the look at him. He, he later on teamed up with JTG and became crowd time. Yeah. MWF song JTG. In, Love that guy. Yeah, rest in peace. Another one that, you know, got a little fame out of Tough Enough was caught lying about his age, the boogeyman. I don't know if you've got that far in your binge watching as of yet. Nah, not yet. I, ah, well, I won't, I won't, I'll, I won't spoil it now. then. I won't spoil yeah. it. Oh, well, I, on, from what I understand, the boogeyman, uh, is it true the boogeyman's coming back? No, you know what the thing is? These. <sighs> I'm going to be nice compared to what I was just going to say. Some wrestling fans don't know or don't understand everything they see or read. The Boogeyman yeah, no, I has... Don't with, I don't believe three quarters of what I read. Boogeyman signed a Legends contract. He has had a Legends contract. Right. He's not coming back as, as a competitor. You know, he'll pop up once or twice a year in a little skit or something like that. But he's not coming back to have wrestling matches. In his entire career, if he had 50 matches, that might be saying something because he was constantly injured. And he didn't break in until he was in his 40s. So for anyone to think that Boogeyman is coming back to work, they're out of their minds. But... It's just people that don't understand what they're saying. And obviously, Boogeyman didn't get into, you know, uh, describe what it was that he was signing and, and, and renewed when he put that out there on social media. It's a shame okay. because, you know what, I personally, I like Boogie very, very, very much. But yeah. I, I hate to say it, but I think he's kind of like a mock. He never broke in. He doesn't understand how the business works. I mean, some of the arguments that him and I had over the years were were very frustrating. A couple of instances I saw things he did I thought were embarrassing, um, but that's a different story for a different time. But I think the human being in The Boogeyman is a great person, someone that really wants to give back to the community, someone that really wants to help kids and kids' organizations. My only wish for Boogeyman would have been that he broke into the business younger and he broke in the right way. And I'll leave it at now, that without saying um, anything negative. You know, when I read something on social media, when I read one thing, I dismiss it. I read something twice, I dismiss it. But when I read a story six, seven times, and they're from reputable sources, then I start to take it serious. And I, I, it, it appears that finally long overdue, The Undertaker is getting his due and is being inducted into the Hall of Fame. That is major news. Well, WWE.com has announced it as well. So if WWE announces it, you can pretty much take it as fact that the dead man is going into the Hall of Fame. And, you know, that makes me kind of sad because I think, you know, there'll be a lot of Paul Bearer stories and anecdotes during that induction. Hopefully, Undertaker is given a great amount of time similar to I don't know if he needs as much time as Ric Flair took in 2008 in Orlando, Florida, but you know, hopefully they limit it to just a handful well, of he's inductees. Like, he's, he's not. I could tell you he's not because he's just not like that. He, exactly, exactly. This, but the stories he could tell, my God, he, he could write. Could, he, he, forget about writing a, a book. He could write an encyclopedia. Yeah, he's um, not going to take a lot of time. Well, I guarantee that. I just, I. It's going to be. I think it's going to be emotional for me. Because I see Percy being tied in, and I almost look at it as the end of his main connection to the industry. And I remember being at WrestleMania 33 in Orlando when he lost to Roman Reigns. And Paul Bearer had told me, actually, you know exactly where it was. It was at the TGI Fridays at the uh, Gold Coast Casino in Las Vegas, Nevada. And he, it was funny enough, he told me and uh, the, the individual I was with who how Undertaker kind of wanted to go out. And it was kind of similar to the end of that Roman Reigns match. Not fully, but similar enough that I thought, okay, this really is it. And I left you know, kind of somber when I left the arena that night until I realized how long it was going to take to get out of the parking lot with one road going in and out of the football stadium. And it took about two and a half hours to get home from the stadium 
uh, to the hotel, but that's a different story for a different time. But that's why I always leave mega early. You just want to get out of there. Yeah. I well, you don't need a repeat. Early. Was it Dallas where you rolled down the hill? Bog down. What? Was it da did Dallas? Is that where you rolled down the hill? Where did you fall? Las Vegas. Oh, Las Vegas. That's okay. Wrong stadium. All right. Well, anyway, I and think that's, it's that's not funny either. No, no, no. I well, you know what? In hindsight, it sounds funny, but when I when it happened, I'm sure it was pretty serious. Yeah. <laughs> and also, we want to send a shout out to our friend Marty Janetti, who was in the emergency room this week. It wasn't COVID related or anything like that. I, th uh, you know, I don't want to get into the man's health too much, but I just think a lot of his. Uh, contributions to wrestling in his 20s and 30s when he was going nuts trying to entertain the fans and abusing his body has really caught up with him. Well, I'll let okay. Marty tell his own story when he comes back to the studio, I think, hopefully next month, knock on wood. Um, but, you know, just... Uh, I, he drives me nuts, but at the same time, he's my friend. I care about him. I want him to be doing well. I want him to be feeling good. So again, fans, without getting into too much of the man's personal info, just send him some positive thoughts. If you're a spiritual person, maybe a prayer or just, you know, some good, I think good vibes go a long way in the world, no matter what the situation may be. Okay. All right. And now on a lighter note, uh, I, I got you. We're not going to mention no names. As per director of five directors. <laughs> but you gotta uh I gotta, gotta click you It's gotta like clean Morton Downey act. Jr. They told me to zip it. You gotta clean up your act in in um in September they're gonna lay you back in the building. Well, again, we can't get into too many particulars about yeah, any any any, any, any names or any venues, but I'll say this uh very unexpectedly. John Cena Sr. laid down the law and said that he would deal, uh, he would take over the situation and deal with the, the individual, uh, the female that we've mentioned many times on the show, which shocked me. I was not expecting that. Uh, we didn't talk about it beforehand. He just, on one of the episodes of uh, Wrestling Inside His Fabulous Fridays with him, he he kind of laid the gavel down and said he will deal yeah, with it and I'm, there will be no I'm BS. sure. I'm pretty sure he got sick of it, just like the rest of it. No just kidding. Like the rest, rest of us. But the thing is, though, uh, on your birthday. Isn't it funny? They get cleared up. That is funny, but what's not funny is the fact that uh, your birthday is well after the 80s uh, event. Correct. That, you know, <laughs> that so what the frick, what the frick difference to it make? You are correct. Well, you know what? The, the thing is, the, the question was, what were we going to do at the Paul Bearer Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive this year? And that was, uh, it's already being bandied around. These events, you know, we have to look at setting things up long in advance for a large event on a large scale with a lot of talent. And you know what? Well, let's take all personalities and persons aside. Memorial Hall, while it is aging, it's a beautiful venue, and if we could fill the place, it's perfect for what we want to do as far as the meet and greets go. It's got that nice private area. Um, it's a spacious area for the talents to change. Lots of There's not a bad seat in the house to watch the show. So in a perfect world, uh, I'd like to see everything go smooth on April 16th, and then we come back guns a-blazing, um, you know, sometime in the fall, getting ready for the Paul Bearer Holiday Headlocks Toy Drive. How things work out, I don't know. You've seen, Oscar, this entire situation has been absolutely insane. I didn't even realize until the other day that all of this happened on my birthday. <laughs> okay, well. But whatever. I'll, if that's what it is, that's what it is. I'm going to tell you one more time. All right. What I've been telling you, first off, keep your head down and your mouth shut because you got a way of rubbing people the wrong way. And, hey, it's, it's, you can't help it. It's just in your nature. Well, what are you going to do? I but, got a lot yeah, of love in my yeah, heart, yeah. but I got a lot yeah. of words in my mouth. You got to stop that. I got okay. a lot of love in my heart and a lot of words yeah. in my mouth. Yeah, right. Well, the words in your mouth, you need to 
shut down with the love of your heart <laughs> and knock it off because you know leverage is something that you are learning you don't have. Well, and, and, and you know you gotta stop. You just got to stop. I think our friends at the ACLU were enough to put a little bit of worry into uh, some of the decision makers. So we'll we'll leave it at that. It's always nice to reach out to people. Well, yeah, you pull the, yeah, look, look at me. Yeah, have you seen me walk? I'm handicapped. How y'all going to do this? You should have took a picture with you in a wheelchair and one of the in a, or in a scooter. Things would have moved along a whole lot quicker. I tell you, I, I just, you know, uh, maybe the when this situation is... And he wears flip-flops, the black tie of it. <laughs> they are not flip-flops. They are slides. <laughs> they are Nike slides. They are Nike slides. Uh. They are not flip-flops. Flip-flops have the thing that go between the toes. These are slides. They're a little, they're a little step above, not much, but a little bit. Step above flip flop. Hey, let me tell you, it's not fun walking around Boston in the winter time in the sleet and the snow and the ice wearing slides. Let me tell you, it's cold. <laughs> it is cold. But hey, anyway, uh, well, hey, hey, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna tell you, this is a true story. All right. The Samoans used to come, especially Alpha, a dead of winter. He used to wear his uh, he used to wear his slides with his toes out with no socks, going into the building all the time. He didn't even wear socks. No, he didn't wear socks. Oh well, see, I at least wear the socks. Nope, he did not. He did not wear socks. I guess he just, I, I guess he just figured he was going uh uh. uh from the car straight into the venue, uh, I, I, I guess. But yeah, no, nah, he didn't. He didn't wear no socks. All right. Well, a, a factoid that we've learned about Alpha. I have not gone the Alpha route. I wear the slide with the sock. But Oscar, we're running out of time on this abbreviated edition. Last week we went almost two hours, and the fans absolutely loved it. Uh, maybe we'll go a little bit longer next week to make up for it. We're still pretty close to an hour when all is said and done, but I'm just, I'm worn down. Three days with the Berserker is a lot. It took a lot of pre-production to get all of our other regular programs done. I need an effing break. I am exhausted. I am tired of being in this building effing 10 to 12 hours a day. Every day, seven days a week, Christmas, Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, Valentine's Day. I didn't even get any love, baby. Well, maybe it's time for you to take another trip down to Orlando. And then, but my, my thing is, the whole time I'll be worried about work, work, work. I can't. Well, that's the thing. That's your choice. You got to stop worrying about it for a weekend. Well, who the hell's going to do it for these great wrestling fans that we love? It'll, you know what? What? There's an old saying, it'll be there when you get back. So, um, I mean, I'm, t I'm telling you, the reason why I say that. And I say this now with an all seriousness. All right. I mean, you will kill yourself if you do not mentally take yourself out of equations in life and then get back to it. You have got to take a break. You will run yourself into the ground. I think after gonna, after April 16th, I need a couple of who, days. Who, who's going to do it if you're not around? Ask yourself that. Good point. Good point. Like after April sixteenth, maybe I need a couple of days. Oh, I, I need well. it before April sixteenth, to be honest. But we just there's so much work to do. We're running low on time. So did you guys make a definitive decision to nix Dallas and just wait for Los Angeles? As a matter of, I don't even know if you and I had discussed that. Yes, as a matter of fact, I, I, I you don't want to know why? Because funny enough. Look at what's happening with Steve Austin. But the ticket sales were so bad. I look at it like if they're only going to do half a stadium, that means there aren't going to be as many fans traveling into the Dallas-Fort Worth area. That means WrestleCon certainly isn't going to draw the crowds that it has in the past. So why not wait for a year where 
there is going to be that larger grouping of people traveling in. And I mean, I don't know if that's going to be Los Angeles next year with uh, where they're trying to put together The Rock against Roman Reigns and Ronda Rousey against Becky Lynch. But I just, you know what? Even with Steve Austin, I mean, is, is Steve Austin going to be able to fill half, sell 50,000 seats extra two nights in a row? He's only going to be on one of the shows. You know what I mean? I, I don't know, but what I do believe is if you really add him into the equation, it's going to make a significant difference. Abs I agree with that 110%, but is it so enough? Before, well, it's going to make, I don't know if, if it's going to fill the place up, but it's going to make a significant difference. So before you guys make a definitive decision, you guys need to factor in that this is what's happening and that it's going to make a difference. And it may just fill in enough people in order for it to make sense for you to go ahead and do it. And I'll, worry about ne next year, next year. I know for when we did the WrestleCon in Dallas last time when they had the 102,000 people, it was a great weekend. Um, but if it's a WrestleMania where there's only 45,000 people in town, and, and I'm sure there's going to be more than that once they announce Austin, but... You know, look, I'll tell you this, Monday Night Raw, you know what Raw used to be like the day after WrestleMania. You sell out within seconds. They haven't right. even opened up most of the balcony. They haven't even opened it up for ticket sales. It's doing so poor. I mean, that's that's a bad sign, Oscar. That's a really well, bad, a bad sign. It's, it's a bad Horrible. sign. Horrible. I know it. it is, but what I imagine what happens a lot of times in these situations is people are still trying to get sight. They still trying to tweak some things. And I do believe that there's going to be a last minute rush where at the last minute, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be totally the polar opposite of what you are seeing right now. I mean, you know, I mean, the truth of the matter is, is WrestleMania is going to do well no matter what. I mean, it's WrestleMania. WrestleMania just has a track record of, of, of doing well. And what you don't get, well, I'll put it like this. I think we all look at it the wrong way. What you don't get one day, you're going to get tantamount to two days at the very least of what you would have gotten if it was a one-day situation. Well, I mean, I can only hope that the, the fans decide to come out and support it. I think it's, it's good for the industry overall. As a, a stockholder in WWE, obviously, I want to see it do well. But, you know, again, when you see half of the stadium, you know, it's one thing for them to have to scale a stadium for the Royal Rumble or SummerSlam. 40,000, 45,000 people for those events, that's very respectable. That's a great night at the office. But for WrestleMania, <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. We can only knock on wood and hope for the best. Um, but for them not to be able to sell out even the scaled uh, American Airlines Arena in Dallas for the night after it for Monday Night Raw is absolutely shocking to me, Oscar. That event usually sells out within a matter of minutes. Now, not only can they not sell it out, but they don't even, they have thousands of seats in the upper deck that they're not even opening up for sale. That's scary as far as the state of the popularity of the industry goes. Yeah, I, I think it was I think it was overly ambitious to have this WrestleMania two nights. I'm not even talking about I, Mania. Just just the simple fact that Raw is doing so no, poor. No, but I'm saying oh. I mean you, you you couple that factor into everything that's going on to have it two nights. I think it was come on in and we've almost finished. Um, um, we it was overly ambitious yeah. to do it two nights in a row. Anyway, I mean, I I think that was and I and I my prayers are going up for Money in the Bank and and SummerSlam. I think doing all these stadium gigs is just a bit of a reach. Yeah, that's just one man's opinion. I mean, I I, I don't think that every pay per view 
warrants that. I mean, I, I really don't. I'll, I'll say this. If they do 40, 45,000 at Money in the Bank and SummerSlam at those two stadium shows in July, I think that's, like I said, I think that's fantastic. I just don't think it's fantastic for WrestleMania. For the Rumble, for Money in the Bank, for SummerSlam, 40,000 people, that's awesome. But not for WrestleMania. Yeah, well. We'll see. I mean, there's a long yeah, way to yeah, go. Yeah, we'll see what happens. But like I said, don't close the door on it, you know, for a, at least a little bit until, you know, until you get a better read of what's happening. Well, to and me. These things have a way of picking up at the last, you know, I just said the last minute, but as time go on, these things are the way of picking up. As a, the studious individual I am, Oscar, the reason why that Monday Night Raw show always sold out almost instantaneously is because there were so many people traveling from out of town and they didn't just want to rush home. If they can't even sell half of the American Airlines arena route for Raw and not even open up these seats for people to buy, that says to me there aren't a lot of people traveling in, as of right now at least, and I think that is a very scary look for WrestleMania 38. I hope it doesn't turn out that way. I'm thinking for the best, like you. I think Steve Austin is going to add a lot of tickets to WrestleMania itself, but as far as the other events go, uh, I well, uh, my hopes on they, high. They, they they did that. They had to do something. So I mean, so that they made a big move. Well. That's for sure. It's they yeah, couldn't have done that's, anything that's bigger. Any final thoughts before we go, Oscar? I'm getting the cue from the back from John C. Manicus Riley. Well, I think even the Undertaker being in in, in in the Hall of Fame, just the fact that he's going to be around, I think that that's going to add a boost. You know, whatever capacity he's going to be around in, just the fact that he's going to be around. Because, see, with him uh, going to the Hall of Fame, you know, he gets to come out you know, with that, with, with the class of, of, of 2022 right. at WrestleMania. So that adds to it, just to, just to see him, whether he's participating or not. Just just to get a glimpse of him is, is you know, adds value. So and I think we'll see what happens. I think WWE would be smart to have that on the opposite night that they use Steve Austin. <laughs> I would have Undertaker and Austin on different nights. Oh, yeah, certainly. All right. All right, buddy, we're running out of time. Any final thoughts before we go? No, nope. I'm going to see everybody next week, and I really just enjoy your week, and uh, see you next weekend at our regularly scheduled time. All right, wrestling fans, after Monday Night Raw next week, we'll be back with an all-new Wrestling Insiders Monday Night Mission. Don't forget those VIP packages and tickets are on sale now to a professional wrestling celebration decades in the making when we go back to the 80s Saturday night, April the 16th at Memorial Hall in Melrose. Get your tickets now over at bostonwrestling.com. I'm Dan Marotti. For your host with the most, the WWF Tag Team Championship Manager Oscar, we bid you adieu from Boston. Take it away, Phil. Good night. Hi, this is Phil DeCesare. Thank you for enjoying tonight's Wrestling Insiders. Get early full screen ad-free access to all our weeknight Wrestling Insider episodes while helping keep wrestling legends working by joining the Boston Wrestling Patreon family at patreon.com backslash Boston Wrestling. You can directly help us bring you more great historical wrestling content seven days a week to enjoy for years to come.